The hottest new database just dropped, AWS DSQL, a distributed serverless Postgres database. That's kind of a lot, so we're gonna look at a demo, talk through it, and explain how it works. So on the right, I've got this demo I built where you can search through movies in the Postgres database. So maybe I want to vote on Fast and Furious. I'm gonna click on this and upvote that movie. And we can see all the most popular movies that people have voted on so far. So maybe I'm also a fan of The Dark Knight and Spider-Man. And we update the timestamps over here on the right when we've updated the item in the database. So we're gonna talk through how I connect to the database, how this demo works. But first, let's talk about this actual database, DSQL. So DSQL just dropped earlier this month at reInvent and they only have a little bit of information out so far. It's in an early preview, but let's talk a little bit about how it works. So it is allegedly the fastest serverless distributed SQL database available for any application. Unlimited scale, high availability, zero infrastructure management. So scales to zero, scales up and auto scales as you need. It has 99.99% availability in single region and 99.999 in multi-region. So that seems pretty good. Uh, it has an active, active distributed architecture. It is Postgres SQL compatible. So it doesn't have everything in standard Postgres, but it has most things. And it allows you to build relational database applications. So the single region clusters are active across three availability zones. So it'll replicate that data across those three different AZs. And then you can also do multi-region. For example, in my demo, I've got two regions that I'm replicating data to. And we've got a nice little diagram here of how this works. So you can read your writes, basically. There's strong consistency. If I make a write to my database, I know that when a visitor tries to read it in another region, we're guaranteed we're gonna have that strong consistency and read the latest data. To help visualize, I just dropped in this image from the Vercel docs on our edge network, and Vercel is built on top of the AWS network. So you can see some parity here with the regions that we're using through Amazon Global Accelerator. And let's say we have data in US East, and we have our database here. Well, with DSQL, we can have multiple regions where our data is replicated to. So maybe we also want US West. And coincidentally, those are the only two that are currently available in the early preview. Now with Vercel, you can run your compute in any of the different edge regions here. So the default where we're running our compute is going to be in US East. But since we have our data in two places, we can also say we want to run our functions in US West as well. And that means that the network communication between the database and the compute is gonna be really fast because they're co-located in the same region. Now, this is much better, for example, than having you know data somewhere on the other side of the world and having to go from your for cell compute that's in US East and you know pop all the way across the ocean and then come back. Even with really fast fiber optic cables, you know the speed of light is a thing. So ideally you really wanna put your compute close to where your data is. So over in everyone's favorite UI, the AWS console, I spun up a DSQL database, Postgres database, Honestly, it was pretty easy to set up. It just kind of gets you right into the product, which I like. And then you can click connect to connect to your database. Now, one of the interesting things here is that the token expires in 15 minutes. So the way you generate the authentication tokens is probably a little bit different than some of the other applications that you've used. So you can copy this here, drop it in the terminal with PSQL and connect to your Postgres database, or we can do it through the application code and the ORM that I'm using inside of our application. So let's pull up the code, start talking about the application, and then we're also gonna talk about how we connected through OIDC. All this code is open source, so if you wanna follow along, deploy your own version, and connect to DSQL, you can do that through GitHub. On the left, I've got the code base pulled up, and we're looking at the file where we're actually making the connection to the Postgres database. So in the future, this will all be built in to Drizzle, the ORM I'm using, but for now, we can see how you would manually connect using the package that the DSQL signer provides. So we forward along the cluster endpoint, the region, and then the credentials that we're using to authenticate with AWS. We get a token. In this instance, I'm just using the admin token. And then 
I'm caching this inside of my uh, module here for 15 minutes, but I set it to 14 just to be safe. Then down here, um, we're setting up a connection pool with Node Postgres. So this is using standard Node.js on Vercel functions. We're gonna use Node.js 22. Don't have to do any you know, different run times. We can just connect directly to Postgres, which is nice. So we get the token and we make a new connection pool. Um, we forward along the endpoint name, admin, the token, the name of our database, Postgres, uh, and so on and so forth. You will need SSL equals true. And then I'm forwarding along that connection to my Drizzle ORM so that I can make queries with TypeScript. That's pretty much here inside of this file. It's all you really need to do to get set up and connected to your database. So the DB cluster endpoint in our code on the left is the same as this endpoint in the right for our DSQL database. And then you'll also see this credentials that we're forwarding along. Now you're, you'll notice we're using an IM role. We're not using a hard-coded secret or some hard-coded access key. And we're able to do this thanks to Vercel's OpenID Connect Federation. So Vercel is able to securely make a connection to AWS or GCP or Azure or any cloud through OIDC without having you hard code in your secrets as environment variables in your project. That's pretty nice. That's a lot more secure. You can rest a little bit easier that you don't have those <laughs> stored away inside of your project. So instead you're using IAM roles. So I, for example, have this uh, role inside of IAM where I've given access to uh, full access to my DSQL database. I've added it to my role. And then I'm able to use that uh, on side of this OIDC identity provider that I've set up inside of our application. So in this instance, I set up the provider. I said what the audience was, which is my Vercel team. And back inside of our trust relationships, we can allow both the preview production and then I've also added development environments here as well. All of this you can copy paste from the Vercel docs. So don't think you need to remember that whole trust relationship setup. But I add this then as an environment variable in my Vercel project, and that's it. I can just use the value when I make my deployments or run in production. When I'm running locally, I can do Vercel and pull on the CLI, and that's gonna pull a Vercel OIDC token to my .env local file on my machine. All right, so let's look at some more of the demo code for this application. So I mentioned how we're connecting to our database. Uh, here's what the schema looks like. We have some movies, just an ID, title, score, and vote time. We have a database session. And then we have votes. So you connect to the application, we create a session and we store it as a cookie, and then you can vote on your favorite movies, which is why you know I can't re-vote on The Dark Knight. And when I reload, this has been saved to a cookie so that I can't re-vote again. Now, of course, you can work around this. This is you know pretty basic, but it was enough for the demo. Now, while we're here, I also gotta mention there are some interesting caveats with DSQL while it's in early preview. You can create indexes when you make the database, but then you can't run a re-index later. And if you add data in your database and then you try to make an index later, that is also not supported yet. You also can't use extensions. So getting search to be fast in this application with no indexing or no kind of advanced searching strategies was a little difficult with you know 5,000 movies, not really a ton but you know, database indexes help a lot. So just something to be aware of while it's in early preview. I'm sure that stuff will get resolved as it uh, moves to stability. Okay, so let's look at what some of the queries look like. Um, if you haven't used Drizzle before, this probably will just look like TypeScript code. So to get the movies, for example, we make a connection to our database. Uh, I'm measuring the time that the query took. Uh, and if you haven't seen the Node.js API to use the web performance API, um, here's a cool example of that. So we filter using this uh, I like to check based on the movie title. We're getting the total number of records. And then this is the kind of drizzle special sauce. We go to the movies uh, table and we're getting back the ID, title, score, last vote time. And we're just gonna get eight at a time. And yeah, down here we're combining it with our session and then we're returning back the movies with the votes. So let me go into um, the rest of our application, which I'm using a Next.js app. It's using ShadCN UI for the UI uh, and it's a pretty simple app. There's really only a couple things here. We've got our 
layout, which is just setting up some metadata and the font for our application, and then the page. So let's take a look at the page, which is kind of the meat of what we're looking at. Uh, we have our home page, which takes in the query params, the search params. Um, the explanation is just the static bit at the top. And then I have a suspense boundary around the dynamic part in our application. So when we're loading, we can show that loading fallback, this loading skeleton component. And let me just go check that out. So this is just a basic loading skeleton using the Shad CN skeleton. And then we render this movies component. Now we're forwarding along the search params and you might be wondering why we're doing this. I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm using some experimental flags in Next.js that will be stable in the future. And what that allows me to do is create a static pre-render of all of this, you know, the static part, the shell of my application. And then this is the dynamic part that's running inside of the suspense boundary. This is called partial pre-rendering. It's not stable yet, but you know, you don't have to turn that on for the code to be structured this way. I'm kind of future-proofing it. So we have our movies component. We read the search params. Uh, if you haven't seen in Next.js 15, search params is now an asynchronous API, which is a signal that it sends to Next.js. Hey, this, this seems like some dynamic code. We get the cookies, we get the session, and then we make our query to our database and we forward it along. So we make this uh, move from our server component where we're fetching the data and we're now forwarding it and we're entering in the client boundary with our movie voting component. Uh, there's kind of a lot going on in this file, but the interesting bit, I think, is that we're using the use optimistic hook from React 19 to show that immediate UI and that immediate mutation to the visitor while some other work is happening in the background. So for example, when I click Dawn of the Apes, or Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, I think there's like 10 of these movies. I click upvote and it's immediately reflected the score or the uh, time is immediately updated. So down below we have this handle vote function, which is what is calling the mutate function from use optimistic to optimistically update that temporary state. And then we call this await vote action, which is our server action to go and actually update the database. So if we take a look at here, we go to the database, get the cookies, um, look for the session, and then we can either make a new session and update the cookies, um, or we can go get the existing vote and update the votes table with the session ID and the movie ID. Then when we call revalidate path in that same network round trip where we come back, we're saying here is the updated data from our database. So we're effectively rerunning that server component and then forwarding the data back to the client. And that's a really fast lightning overview of this app. Again, the code's all open source if you wanna check it out, but just a cool example of working with Postgres, working with DSQL, this new database. And there's one more thing I wanna show you. We just recently launched a new observability product for Vercel, a standard version as well as a plus version. And it's awesome that I can go in here and see the invocations happening for the function powering this that's connecting to my database. I can see if there were errors, I can see the latency or the different external APIs that I'm talking to. Uh, I also have flipped on in function concurrency, which allows you to save a bunch of money on your Vercel function cost. In this instance, my app has basically no traffic, so I'm only saving about 3%. But as this gets more scale and the majority of time spent in my functions is doing database IO, I can save you know, up to 50, 60% of my compute costs. And this also helps me see you know, what percentage of functions are hot, what percentage of functions are cold, and how long it's taking for those functions to run. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff in this new observability tab so you can understand the performance of your application better and kind of know where to drill in and investigate. So that's a lightning demo of DSQL Postgres, a distributed Postgres database. Still super early, there were some hiccups along the way with things that aren't yet supported, but I'm interested to see how it shakes out. Pricing also hasn't been released, so it's kind of hard to make a fair comparison with other Postgres databases on the market to see you know, how many features of Postgres are gonna be supported, what the pricing structure is gonna look like, but at least for a really early look, it seems pretty interesting, it seems pretty promising, so I'm gonna keep my eyes on this one. If you tried it out already, let me know, and until the next video, peace.